<laughs> oh baby, no baby, you got me all wrong, baby. My baby's already got all of my love. That was what she, I was singing. And she said, you have to sing that when we go on. And I said, no, I already don't feel good about myself. <laughs> and she said, but I will sing it with you. I and, learned it really fast. And then we did with Andy Grammer. Anyone who I like Andy Grammer. missed the very beginning, I would say it's worth going back and watching the recording because I don't want to like chew their horn too hard, but that was kind of amazing. No, it, well, amazing is a strong word, but it can be taken many ways. And so, yeah, <laughs> it was brilliant, you guys. Wow. I don't know. Well, let's see who's coming on. It's Alexa <laughs> and so Ashley shy. and Amy. It's like they're coming on in, in, in Hi, alphabetical Karen. order today. Hi, and Gigi. Gail, Monica's still off, but Cindy broke the alphabetical pattern. Cindy. Ashley from Brisbane. Hi, Ashley. How you doing, mate? Gigi. Monica and Gail and Kim and Pam, Pam and Lucy. Norman. Pam Norman. You, you got, got me all wrong, wrong Norman. <laughs> already got all of my Norman. Why is it a silly thing? I Dave? don't know. Nobody knows. I don't know. Hello, Diana. I live in Don't Know Mind. Oh, you Why do so I wholly abruptly start singing Andy Grammer songs? I'm like, it's a subliminal message that it's time for you to go work out. Not, not right now. Don't worry. I don't think so. No? I'm very excited. Her, some her workout mix. I'm super excited because of all the things that we learned that I'm going to talk about. I'm really excited. I'm oh, waiting. Yeah. Oh, it's 152 people. My goodness. We're trying to get out of even doing here. Ah. Same when we see. Away, oh, Badger. Way. Oh, and by the way, Badger is better. Yay, Badger. I feel better. Thanks, everyone, for all your, your lovely messages last yeah. night. Yeah. Y'all better now. Yeah. Okay, so you guys, yesterday I watched the most amazing thing. I did not know this about the way people grow babies specifically. And there was a woman whose name I forget because it was in a documentary and that's the disadvantage of seeing things on a screen. But what did she do for her livelihood? She measured babies. She measured them fanatically and recorded everything she measured. And what she found, she measured her first baby ever and she said, it's a two person process to measure a baby. Someone has to hold the baby down, and another person has to stretch the baby out. <laughs> I was like, well, you probably missed your calling in the Inquisition. Anyway, she did measure these babies. Well, she measured her neighbor's baby, and she measured it one day, and the next day she went back to measure it, and it was two centimeters longer. Whoop! And she thought she was doing it wrong. Then she went back and measured it for like five more days, and it didn't change at all. So then she thought she just didn't know how the heck to measure a baby, but then she perfected her baby measuring methods. And it turns out that, you know, they show these growth cards, charts, babies getting bigger and bigger and bigger. No, not so much. A baby will stay exactly the same size for like up to two, three weeks. They don't, they don't change at all. And then literally in one 24 hour period, they'll grow two centimeters. And then they stay again and then they grow again and they stay again and then they grow again. And the times when they were growing correlated with times when they were fussy and hungry. Of course, they were growing. So I was thinking about it. I was like, what is going on here? I thought, well, the baby is used to having a body of a certain size. And that's a tremendous number of things that the baby is trying to calibrate because it's, it's got to move its hands, its eyes. It's, I mean, really, there's a lot of moving parts, right? And it's like a baby elephant trying to use its trunk. They're like, and babies are the same way with their hands and feet. So the baby gets used to it. The brain integrates the baby at a certain size, and that takes it a while. And then it takes, it, it comes to a place of, of relative equilibrium, and it says, I'm going to put some energy into growth. Bam! Two centimeters in one day. That's like an inch almost in one day after not growing at all for three weeks. So then... The baby gets ravenously hungry. That's one thing because it's growing very, very fast. But the other thing is right after the new size, which is sudden, it's not like, ooh, today I'm a millimeter longer and then a millimeter longer. It's just bam. That means that the brain is in a body that's a different size. So of course the baby's going to freak out, right? Like, ah, it's not working the same. And when I looked back on my own babies, I remember them growing this way. I'll never forget, and, and learning this way. I, I'll never forget putting my youngest down on a Persian carpet and she could she, she noticed the fringe. 
if you've had babies, you know they're obsessed with fringes. Don't know why. Some evolution, I'm sure someone out there will explain it to me. But she saw it. She'd seen it a million times. She was maybe four months old. And just one day, she just went mad trying to reach it. And she would like thrash her body. And, like, and after about, I don't know, half an hour, she was maybe this much closer to it. So she kept repeating the whole flagellation until she got all the way to the fringe. And she could like, now she could go to fringes of rugs and that's all she did for about, I don't know, a month and then she discovered something else. So then I started thinking, wait, this sounds just like punctuated equilibrium, which is a theory of evolution, which is well supported, which is not that things are always mutating, growing and mutating and growing and over time they become different. And a chicken, a white chicken has a gray chicken, who has a charcoal chicken, who has a slate chicken, who finally has a black chicken, no. No, what happens is animals will stay almost the same for a long period, and then bam, lots of mutations, lots of, of evolutionary leaps. And then I thought, wait, punctuated equilibrium has also been used to explain change in groups, like families and work teams, same thing. The more connected a group, the more it'll show periods of relative stasis, where everybody has the same norms and everything, but then maybe the, the environment is changing, things are pressuring the system, it stays the same as long as it can, and then bam, there'll be a big disruption, the rules change, people leave, people come in, changes, the levels of authority change in a company, whatever, and it happens in these punctuated evolutionary leaps. And then I thought, Maybe everything's a, a metaphor for everything else because that's the way subatomic particles, that's the way they go into different energy states. Like an electron that's in a high energy state, it, it holds a certain energy state. And it's like you can add more energy into the system and it doesn't grow gradually. It takes in as much as it can and then it reaches a threshold and bam, goes to a totally discrete energy state, bigger. So I thought, Maybe this is just how everything grows. Like maybe, because if you think about it, wasn't it that way when you were trying to learn math or to learn a language in school? Like, you're like, ah, I don't get this, ah. And then one day you wake up and it's like, wait, I understand it all perfectly. And I decided it's um, this leaping forward and then integrating maybe the pattern that we need to allow ourselves to follow. So I've talked a lot um, in my self-help work, in my coaching and everything <clears throat> about how our culture gives us a linear progress of growth and expects us to just keep getting better and better and better at everything every day, just up in a straight line, no going back. Other cultures, traditional cultures, see things as cyclical so that, you know, winter follows, Autumn follows, summer follows, spring, and they just go round and round in a repeated cycle. And, and what I like to use as my model of change is a spiral. So it's going around and you have seasons of prosperity and seasons of poverty and seasons of health and seasons of illness. And you have summer, winter, spring, and fall. And every time you go through a, a whole rotation, it moves forward in a sort of spiraling way. Maybe a vortex because it gets bigger every time. Whoa, and I love vortices. Who doesn't love a vortex, right? Okay, so this is what I was thinking. That linear process doesn't allow for punctuated equilibrium. It doesn't allow for, and, and this is the other thing, that as I watched the way babies grow, I thought the reason for this, there's a reason for it that I had never thought before. And that is that the time of stasis is a time of integration. So you integrate, and I've just finished writing my book on integrity, which is, you know, same word as integrate. You become one solid thing, everything's working great, and then something disrupts the system, boom. And then you go forward, but it's also very disruptive. And you may think that you're backsliding. And that's why I put this title online today, when you, you maybe think you're sliding backward, when in fact you're leaping forward. Because it's when, baby wakes up and he's suddenly an inch longer, that's when he was like, what is going on? Like all this new size, all this new complexity for the brain to integrate that, for the body to integrate that, for the emotions to integrate it. That's why you can't just keep learning and learning because there's no time to get a handle on things. So this, I think, 
is also the way we progress as spiritual beings. And as you know, the gathering room is my opportunity to talk spirituality, non-religious spirituality without any apology. I'm just right in it. Um, and I think that, you know, so many of us read about, oh, for example, enlightenment is the end of suffering. Wouldn't that be awesome? I wish I could do that. But, I, and then we try to take steps toward it. And I think that, well, every, all the masters tell us that there, there's one big discrete change and it is like a quantum, a quantum leap. In fact, David Hawkins is one person who's written about enlightenment as levels and levels and levels. You know, it's like, and, and even in, um, in Buddhist philosophy, in Hindu philosophy, in Dante's Divine Comedy, the source of, of all things is described as a many-petaled flower, so a rose or a lotus blossom, and it just keeps opening and opening. So there's this constant, like there's a new emanation of light all the time. But even so, like it, when Dante's going through paradise in the Divine Comedy, he keeps going, there are different levels, even though they're not real. He's being Beatrice, his long lost love is showing him through paradise. And she tells him there's, this is all just one thing and one um, point. And like, there's only one thing here in terms of what is real, but in terms of the way you see it has levels in different places and different people. She's like, I can't get around that, which is exactly what I just read in a book about the, um, what's the, the austere interpretation of quantum mechanics says that everything's, I talked about this before because I love the book. It's called Something Deeply Hidden. So good. It's about how everything is just one in the universe is one wave dictated by the Schrodinger, Schrodinger equation, like Schrodinger's cat. Yeah. So all of this, just to say he's in this place. And as far as his knowledge goes, he has to go in levels. Now, in, in terms of what actually exists, he's already there. He's already enlightened. You can't not be enlightened. We're all just one being. So if anything's enlightened, everything's enlightened. But from an individual human perspective, he had to go through levels. And he'd go to a level, and it's, I actually got annoyed with Dante at one point. I'm like, would you stop with the same theme? Because what keeps happening is it's so much more beautiful. There's so much more light. There's this incredible music and it keeps getting more beautiful. And each time he goes to a new level, his body and his brain can barely tolerate it. And often, often he goes light blind and he goes deaf. There's one place where Beatrice won't smile at him and everything is silent. It's like on the seventh of nine levels or something. And he's like, what's the deal? Why won't you smile at me? And she says, if I were to smile at you from this level of presence, the the beauty of it and the love in the smile in my smile would destroy you you can't handle it yet so he has to climb through the whole level and like get his strength together right leap and integrate leap and integrate and then she does smile at him and he's literally like i can't tolerate it he keeps fainting going blind going deaf getting his sight back getting his hearing back and it's like all right think of another device epic poet but i think that he wrote that poem to describe something that really happened to him. And other people who've gone through enlightenment experiences describe it very much the same way. So here's my point. Maybe you're like working on yourself, you're reading spiritual books, you're, you're meditating, you're doing whatever it is, centering prayer, whatever works for you, that's making you feel more spiritual, more enlightened. And then you'll have a big breakthrough wow, I see things in a different way. I, I felt so much more compassion today. I let go of a grudge. I didn't, by the way, never force yourself to let go of anything. It, it drops away when it's ready. You just go, oh my God, I feel so much better. And then the next day, bam, like you feel you're on the freeway in your rental car and you're trying to follow the directions on your phone and they keep switching and your friends keep texting love hearts to each other and you're screaming at your phone to your friends, stop it, just stop it. Not that I've ever had an experience anything like that. Just made that up. <laughs> anyway, you think you're doing really well. And then you realize that, no, you're not anywhere. <laughs> like you're the, the furthest thing from enlightened. So what was all that spiritual work about? What was all that spiritual progress about? I think it was about punctuated equilibrium. And I think that every time we take a big step forward, we go to rack and ruin for a while. Just had a 
random memory of learning to play tennis and how I thought I was getting pretty good. I was. And then someone corrected my backhand because it was really, really incorrect form. I couldn't hit anything. Backhand, forehand, serve, nothing. I just basically ran into the net and fell down over and over until I really integrated that one motion. So the moral of it all is add a piece to your growth to your your knowledge if you're trying to learn something if you're trying to learn a skill or a language or something <clears throat> give yourself time to let stuff build let stuff build and feel confused and feel confused and like it's not really working it's not really taking <clears throat> and then watch this will happen one day boom you'll be like oh i had an insight i remember i i had a dream in chinese or whatever it was I had a dream in Italian after reading the Divine Comedy, except I don't speak Italian. So I think it was just gobbledygook, nevertheless. Anyway, um, you'll have one of these things like, oh my God, my brain's really integrating this stuff. And then just when you think you've got it made, ah, what do I do in a being that's this size? I just grew three levels of of heavenly brightness and beauty and glory overnight. And I can't handle the truth. You can't handle the truth. Yeah, not until you've integrated, but that's okay. Cause that's how everything in the universe gets bigger and gains energy and gets happy. This is my thought. So now I would like to take some questions, please. Here they come. Here it comes. The felonious badger. Have you ever committed a felony? How dare you? <laughs> Look at me. Would Ooh. this face ever commit a crime? Oh, that would this hair is ever a crime. <laughs> <laughs> this face is a crime. <clears throat> speak to me, badger. I will speak to you. Speak to me. I have questions. Of River, our friend River. Hi, from River. Light into Light. Um, asks, how can you cultivate compassion for yourself in the downward parts of the spiral? You have to be really deliberate and actually articulating this and seeing babies specifically do it because they're so adorable and they don't know. So you can't be angry at them. Like, baby, why did you not get to the rug fringe earlier? <laughs> and why have you not grown for two weeks? To get baby. on it, you stupid baby. No, you can't. It, it, once you know that this is how growth happens and that it takes a long time to have a spurt, a growth spurt, and growth spurts are then accompanied by insatiable cravings and, and um, severe mood swings. That helps you say when you're in one of those, oh my gosh, I think I'm in the middle of a growth spurt. I'm in a new level of my process of maturation in the world, and that's hard. So when a baby has a tantrum for that reason, and you know that's why it's easier to like wait out the tantrum you, and, and to be kind because you know it's not the baby just changed into a monster that's the way we learn and um it's disruptive and we can have compassion on that and then we just turn that on ourselves and say things literally to yourself that you would say to a baby you're doing your very best you just had a big growth spurt you deserve to lie down yeah. have a snack and cuddle yeah. yeah and you can howl and howl yeah you can you scream want your head off yeah I do. So do I. <laughs> <laughs> and then we come on and sing. Um, Trisha Elliott. Hi, Trisha. Hi, Trisha. Um, is wondering if burnout is a result of forcing ourselves to keep up rather than allow for leap and integration. What an excellent point. Yeah. That linear model of growth is a tormentor because think about all the people. Like um, sometimes I talk about Shin Zen Young, who's a meditation master. And if he's not enlightened, he's very close to it. But he was a horrible math student. He could not do math to save his life, not even simple. And it was the source of huge um, frustration in his family and tears and tantrums and everything. Well, he went off and be, he became a Zen monk. Then he got curious about the nature of the universe and started studying. Now, you know what he does? He's a mathematics professor because he was a brilliant mathematician. He just had his brain hadn't caught up with that yet. So we take kids, we standardize everything they're supposed to do. We take ourselves, we standardize what we're supposed to be capable of doing on any given day. We measure ourselves against this invisible, non-existent linear growth curve that we think everybody else is on. And then we're hard on ourselves because we haven't grown two centimeters in a day when that only happens once in a blue moon. Or we're hard on ourselves because we get out of sorts when we've had a growth cert 
spurt when that's part of the integration process. Yeah. So yeah, it's a, it's a way that culture again has made a mistake that tortures particularly children, but I think it tortures all of us. Yeah. This linear growth model. Oh, so Everything so goes like this. Like that. Yeah. Like a fun computer game. <laughs> um, Marty, mm. people are really interested in what you said about, you said just as a side about grudges that you don't need to let go. And they were even saying maybe we could do oh. the whole episode. Ooh, that would be this. good. I went to um, Multiversity 1440 um, up by San Francisco a couple weeks back. Hi, everybody who was there. And the first woman that I coached on stage had suffered a horrible loss. She'd lost a child and someone else was responsible. Um, accidental, but responsible. And from like minute one, people were telling her to forgive. And I was like, are you serious? So we did the arm test, which you coaches will know. I had her, I showed her how much weaker she was in her musculature when she was trying to force forgiveness for this horrible loss. And, and I said, so it's not time to forgive. And she suddenly became very strong. And I said, there you go. And she said, oh, it's such a relief to have the validation. And I said, I didn't validate anything. Your body became strong. You knew that. You knew that. So this is what we have to be strong enough to do is when culture pushes against us to keep that, it doesn't want it as bursting out, right? It wants the equilibrium. That's why it's so hard at the end of the time. It's like, and when something massive happens, like the loss of a child or loss of anything, and people say, no, forgive, forgive. What they're saying is don't grow to the next level. Don't let the disruption take you out of this. She was headed up. I mean, integrating that is going to be the last the rest of her life, but it will get a lot easier. It's not true that you never heal from the death of a loved one. And in the meantime, my God, let yourself feel what you're feeling. Every bit of it, rage, hatred, um, despair. They're all, it's important to give yourself a, a, a baby's swaddle in which to have those feelings. Those are normal when you're integrating a massive emotional issue. It's all normal. As long as we just love it, care for it, and know that it's all for the good. Yeah. Brilliant. We could do a, we could definitely do an episode on this. Though. Yeah, it's we should. Topic. We should because the pressure to forgive is the ultimate cultural pressure because it keeps the system from ever moving at all. It's also a good thing if you've done it. <laughs> I don't come out against forgiveness. <laughs> Martha Beck slams concept <laughs> of forgiveness. <laughs> I've forgiven all kinds of people. Yeah, you have. Um, Tiffany asks, can healing from trauma move us forward? Sometimes I feel held back by a traumatic event that happened last year, but perhaps this is integration from post-traumatic growth. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, I like that. A lot of people about. say that the reason, it's called the repetition compulsion, and we actually create, Alice Miller called it the, the drama of the gifted child, and she says if a child can't resolve a trauma from childhood intellectually, um, then as an adult, we recreate the same situations. So we find someone to marry who's like our abusive parent, or we put ourselves in an employment situation that is like our crazy family or whatever. And the reason is that we need to study the trauma and play it out so that we can get healthy within that and set boundaries appropriately and say no to things that were hurtful. That requires things like anger, boundary setting, relies on anger it's the immune system it's the emotional system's immunity coming up so if you try to never ever show these socially disruptive emotions or feel them you don't grow and you don't overcome trauma trauma is looking for you to set boundaries on the on the things that were done wrong to you that's a john o'donohue quote a boundary is the sacred act mm -hmm. the sacred no, no anger, anger is the sacred emotion that heals the boundary that once was violated yeah that's a good thing to do. And you don't hurt anyone in the meantime. You're good to people. Yeah. Yeah. No one's going yeah. outrageous. Pay your taxes. So we t we've been talking about this to pay your taxes. We've been, <laughs> for God's sake, people. <laughs> I don't know. Do good. Uh, feed feed pigeons. Oh. <laughs> but if I feed my kittens and you feed the pigeons, it's the circle of life. Eat the pigeons. 
in a way. <laughs> You're feeding my kids <laughs> with your pigeons. Okay, look, it's gets here. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm very disruptive today. Yeah, because it's disrupted evolution. It is. There you go. Punctuate equilibrium. Oh, what's the next question? Karen asked early on, because we've been talking about this in terms of a lot of psychological stuff, but I also yes. love you know, what you were saying about the spiritual yeah. perspective. So Karen was asking, is this how our consciousness evolves? I think it is. I think, you know, if you go down to subatomic particles and they're doing it, then you go to babies and they're doing it, then you go to human groups and they're doing it, then you go to life as a whole and it's doing it. Why would the universe not be doing it? And why would consciousness also not be doing it? If, if, you're, if you take a biocentrist position, if you've ever read Biocentrism by Robert Lanza, it's an interesting counter point to the austere theory of quantum mechanics back to my point <laughs> i just read that book again yesterday biocentrism says that the universe is the product of consciousness and therefore everything in it grows like consciousness and to suit consciousness because consciousness is making it happen in the first place and i have to say that no other interpretation of the universe that i know in physics takes account of consciousness at all so if it exists and it's got to be in the system i say yes that is how, that is why we're here. This whole human life is a massive disruption in our spiritual existence. It's hard. We don't know what's going to happen. We think we're going to die. We're sure we're going to die. We don't really believe we're going to die, but then we think we are. It's not easy. And I think it's part of something that is a massive growth spurt that we then integrate. And it consists of multiple iterations of that very same process. Right. Right down to our cellular level and the way we grow taller and maybe the way we grow older and the way I grow kooky. You talk about the storm before the calm. That's one of mm. the ideas that I've heard you expound upon. And I wonder if that could be said to be part of this, that sometimes there's all this tumult and that maybe that's the integration process. You know what I think it is? I think I mislabeled my daughter's fit about the rug fringe because she was the famous rug So I'm saying that after you grow, you have this integration. Ah! But she was at the top of her level and she needed, she needed a quantum leap. She needed to go from still, don't move this body, to move this body through space. And that's a huge leap. Mm -hmm. So what I think we do, um, with our spirituality is we get to a point what was the question storm before the calm that's it so we get to a point where we feel like things have to happen things have to happen and then the leap itself is this huge like shuddering thing and then boom we're in this new space and it's like oh this is better than it's ever been and then we have to integrate it and do, go through it all again. So I think there's right around the leap, there is a lot of disruption. There's the feeling of the system having too much energy to maintain its current energy state. Mm -hmm. It's going oh. to, then there's the leap itself, which is terrifying, according to all the enlightened peoples. Terrifying. Layer after layer of terror. David Hawkins, even Byron Katie, says she was terrified when she first felt she was the universe. So there's a terrifying transition. And then there's this integration where you're like, what is this new thing? I don't know how to work it. Mm. And um, and that's hard too. But then there are the calms in between where you don't have to grow a single centimeter for weeks on end. And you're just like, I'm going to put everything in my mouth because I'm a baby. <laughs> and I never outgrew that stage. No. She's, yeah, so that's she's that. ready for her growth spurt around <laughs> putting random objects in. Her mouth. Yeah, soon I will stop putting slugs into my mouth. <laughs> Oh, no, that's that's a joke. Um, <laughs> a letter says, is sleeping, feeling very confused to do simple things, and memory is part of this growth. Absolutely. Absolutely, you guys. I said I finished my book this last week. Shout and out to Martha. Oh, I she finished editing. a damn book. It didn't need editing. Okay, so, but here's the thing. The last chapter blew my mind because, not because my chapter blew my mind, but because of all the stuff I was reading triangulated and it blew my freaking mind. And I started sleeping 11 hours a night. That's true. Like, I would, I would get up at like 9 a.m. and I think, I've slept 11 hours. I'm going to be great. And by 9 p.m., I was like, I cannot keep my eyes open. I was sleeping and I, I told my family, I said, I feel like I'm six, eight years old when I used to have those hard sleeps when I was a growing child. And, and then weird things did happen in the night. I dreamed Dante was in my room speaking Italian. When I woke up, it either that or dream. Dante was in her room. <laughs> yeah, either that, one or the other. 
I'm not clear which. <laughs> no, it was very, it was a very intense thing though. I yeah. woke up with a feeling of no self whatsoever. Just, yeah, it was really something. And then I like face planted. <laughs> Hence, lying around watching documentaries about babies. Uh, By the way, you guys should check it out on Netflix. Oh, it's babies. so great. Babies. It's new. It's awesome. Yeah. People are, people go nuts measuring babies. <laughs> you gotta hold them down and stretch them out. It's a whole lifestyle. <laughs> um, I just want to shout out to Karen Stiles who says, oh my gosh, the burden of linear growth. I have recently been so frustrated with this myself thinking, didn't I learn this already? I hear you, girl. Ooh, 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 ooh. So yeah, wherever you are in the phase, if you're in a, if you're in a, an equilibrium time, enjoy. That's living off the fat of the land. If the energy is getting too tight, and you know I can't stay in this job, or I can't stay in this marriage, or whatever it is, much longer. Boom! Get ready for a big change. You're not going to be trapped where you are. It can't be done. If you're in the middle of a rapid transition and you think everything's exploding in your life, that's because you're getting bigger and it's great. And this is how you felt when you were a baby and you grew two centimeters in one day. And then if you have just grown and you're in a new place and you don't know where everything is and like if you've moved to another part of the country or you're in a different job or you're in a new relationship, it's like, oh, how do the pieces work? I thought I did this before. That's what happens after every quantum leap. It's all good. It's all good. So we love you. Oh, baby. No, baby. You got me all wrong, baby. My baby's already got all of my love. And it's this long. <laughs> Maybe this long. <laughs> it, it, it had all of my love, but now it's too good. I need more love. Oh, Two no. centimeters more love. Stan. <laughs> love Sorry, you. Sorry, silly. Bye. We love you. We'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.